we have two talks. The first is uh, Dr. Dita Oshadlias. Um, Dita is possibly known to most of us as the former ringing coordinator for SAFRIN, uh, a post that he held at the, uh, at the former animalography unit for years. Um, Dita is um, currently one of, the, uh, one of the folk who sets up uh, bird ringing uh, um, opportunities and workshop uh, in South Africa. Uh, Dita, I'm not sure whether you've had any further afield at this stage, but uh, I think you might have um, been a little bit further afield as well. Um, Dita is going to be telling us about uh, his favorite ringing experiences, sights, uh, presumed birds that he enjoys ringing. Uh, Dita, it's, uh, it's lovely to have you with us this evening and uh, sharing with us your experiences. So I think uh, we'll hand over directly to you. Right. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I have suffered a bit, as everyone else has, uh, last year because of lockdown. And around September, I decided that our family needed a holiday. And so the place that I chose is this fantastic farm called Feinbossi Estate. And I told uh, my wife and son that, you know, there would be animals uh, to entertain and a wonderful swimming pool, September being in summer, uh, to swim in. Uh, but of course, secretly, all I wanted to do was to do <laughs> lots of ringing. And, and my fi family understands that. And so they did help release birds and uh, join in seeing the amazing birds that we were catching. But I chose Feinbos Estate because it's just such a fantastic place. It's not too far from Cape Town, just an hour's drive and beautiful scenery. It's got a wonderful mountain, different habitats, reeds, woodland, around the farmhouse, vineyards, and of course the Feinbos, which is really great. And so I'll talk for a few minutes uh, about Feinbos Estate, and then I'll move on to some other places and birds. So, one of the attractions is the nectivores, and there's a patch of beautiful proteas just outside uh, one of the chalets. And so you can see the Cape sugar birds, which we were catching, uh, southern double collared sunbird, and beautiful malachite sunbird. So really great to have these birds in the hand. And then there's a, a piece of woodland that extends along a stream and uh, so we've had some amazing birds, Cardinal, Woodpecker, Cape Robin Chat, Lots, African uh, Paradise Flycatcher, Fairy Flycatcher, the Acacia Pied Barbet and its uh, brood parasite, the Lesser Honey Guide, and lots more. The, this piece of woodland runs along and at one end, there is a large dead tree and I call it the Cardinal Woodpecker tree. Uh, we often see the cardinal woodpeckers hanging around there. They move up and down uh, the strip of woodland. Uh, and so I decided this is really the place to catch them, put up nets as high as I could go, uh, which is still not high enough. And we certainly caught a few birds, but not nearly as many as I'd hoped at this particular uh, spot. But it was amazing because while waiting for birds, there were so many birds coming to perch in the top of the tree barn swallow, uh, brimstone canary feeding young, of course the cardinal woodpeckers passed by, uh, jackal buzzard, and uh, I will have to just move the, how do you move the, uh, let's do that, so, okay, there. the class is cuckoo, fiscal flycatcher, and uh, even a southern grey-headed sparrow uh, breeding in the tree in this nest hole. Uh, probably made by the woodpeckers. So uh, certainly lots of entertainment, uh, uh, watching the birds and catching a few, uh, as well as catching much more in other nets nearby. Uh, then of course in the Feinbos, all sorts of specials. This is just a small selection uh, of what we catch there, the Southern Grey Tit, uh, Barthrow to the Parlis, 
long tail, uh, long bold crombeck with a very short tail, the uh, Bok Makiri Shrike, uh, not so easy to catch. They keep moving around and calling all day long, but we haven't caught uh, too many too often. Right, and then my favorite, the reed beds where the weavers roost at night. And uh, uh, there are hundreds of Cape weavers roosting there as well as other birds. So if you zoom in a little, you can see there they are getting ready to fly out in the early morning. And so we've caught, uh, starting at the bottom right, uh, Cape weavers and above that Southern mast weaver, Southern red bishop, uh, and the bottom left uh, yellow uh, bishop. Uh, and good numbers of yellow bishop. I really enjoy catching them there. And then very few red bolt quelia, not too many. In fact, we never even saw them there. We only saw them in the net. So that was quite a surprise. Uh, the Fangbos estate, together with uh, BDI, we've had uh, three expeditions with international guests uh, coming to ring there. In one case, students uh, doing a research project. In the other cases, uh, ringers, qualified ringers, coming just to experience a bit of Africa. And uh, we had really exceptionally good times in terms of numbers of birds caught, the diversity, and then going for a champagne sunset uh, uh, lookout uh, at the top of Dragon Ridge uh, with a view down. Really uh, an amazing experience and uh, probably my favorite site close to Cape Town. Of course, I've got lots of sites uh, for uh, single morning ringing sessions, which are practical and close by, but for anything more than a day, Fainbos Estate is the place I like to go. But of course, there are lots of places uh, further afield. And uh, I would say that my favorite garden bird ringing is in a little garden uh, in the Zululand forest area. Unfortunately, a lot of plantation, but also some natural forest. Uh, my brother-in-law lives there, Tony, a really good birder. And in his garden, I've caught these species and many more. I'm not even gonna name them all now because of time, but as you can see, lots of weavers, lots of other interesting birds. But what I will name is some of the birds that I've caught there for the very first time uh, before I've caught them anywhere else. And some of them I've only caught there so far. So ashy flycatcher, scaly-throated honey guide, green twin spot, uh, golden-tailed woodpecker, red-fronted tinkerbird, gray waxbill. So uh, really uh, amazing birds. Uh, so the diversity uh, just in one garden from, uh, it's largely because he feeds birds, but also birds pass through from the surrounding natural forest. So I've done lots of ringing in Zululand beyond just this one garden near Matuba Tuba. And it's subtropical. There are great birds to be caught in the wetlands and the forests and other habitats in the surrounding areas. So anyone wants to go to Zululand, let me know and I can take you or point you out to some really great ringing sites and birding sites as well. Uh, just some more of the species I've caught in Zululand in general, some scarcer species like Southern Brown-throated uh, Golden Weaver, Birchall's Kukul, and all sorts of other birds, and lots more than just the ones shown here. The one bird that I've caught, or the sunbird that I've caught the most of in Zululand is the olive sunbird. I'm going to play its call. I hope you can hear that. I'm not sure if the sound is going through, but uh, even if it's not, the thing that strikes me whenever I hear the sunbird calling is that it just reminds me of uh, a bird called the Seychelles Fodi. And so now we will go to the Indian Ocean. Uh, this is the Seychelles Fodi. I couldn't find a sound clip of the actual song, which is uh, reminiscent of the Olive Sunbird song. Uh, the, on Zeno Canada, there are calls of the species, but not the song. So you will just have to simply uh, come on a ringing expedition to the Seychelles or a bird uh, watching uh, trip. Uh, to hear the call, uh, the song for yourself. I've been really fortunate over the last 10 years. Uh, I've visited the Seychelles five times, uh, always to 
help uh, train the nature conservation staff. The Seychelles is amazing because of the endemic birds like the Seychelles blue pigeon, uh, as well as all the seabirds, for instance, the sooty tern. So I'll focus a bit more on the seabirds, uh, just to give uh, an illustration of, of just what's on offer in the Seychelles. Oh, but first, uh, map. The, the Seychelles has over 100 islands, many of them small and uninhabited, uh, but here are the inner islands. Mahe in the bottom is the largest, and that's where the international airport is located. And in uh, five trips, I've visited four, or done ringing on four islands, frigates, uh, Arid, Kuzan, and Cuisine. And uh, these are all have no cats and no rats, which is why they have good populations of endemic birds as well as seabirds. It's also exciting uh, whenever I visit to be able to help with the long-term monitoring projects that are on the go, notably Seychelles Rubler Project, which is mainly on Kuzan Island. And uh, they, the bird occurs on some other islands as shown on the slide, uh, but the, most of the color ringing is happening on Kuzan and the research project with PhD students. And the local project, Seychelles Magpie Robin, uh, which is found uh, naturally on Fregate Island still. It was found on many other islands, uh, but became extinct. It has now been reintroduced uh, to Kuzan, Cuisine, and Arid. So you can see the current numbers of these birds, or especially the magpie robin, is still quite low. Uh, both of these species nearly became extinct uh, before, I think in the 1960s or so, before drastic conservation measures were taken. And so the birds are doing fine, have been reintroduced to several islands and uh, populations are increasing. So they try to catch each individual uh, either chicks or if the chicks uh, hatch in nests that are inaccessible, then by uh, mist netting uh, the adults later on. So I've caught some of the birds. I don't put colorings on. I just take them to the staff working on the birds and then they will put colorings on if they don't have already, or I'll just report the, all the details uh, uh, to them when I've caught any of these. Right, so the seabirds. Uh, the lesser noddy, which is shown in most of the photos here, is really common and very easy to catch. In fact, you can just put up a mist net anywhere and they will just flop into the net, uh, especially the young birds, sometimes the adults as well. They nest in these large colonies and trees and they're just uh, incredibly high numbers. Also catch a few brown noddies. It's a lot larger in the hand and you can also see the black uh, in front of the face, uh, in front of the eye on the face reaches up to the beak, unlike uh, the white noddy where it's white in front of the eye. So it's quite easy to tell them apart as well as the size. And so that's the seabird I've ringed most of in the Seychelles just because they're so incredibly easy to, to catch. Right, then the Audubon's shear water, you don't even need mist nets. They forage out at sea at night and they fly uh, back to their burrows on the islands at night, uh, but often they're attracted to the lights of the staff houses, and so they'll end up flying onto your stoop or your veranda, uh, and if your door is open of your bedroom, they often even fly into your bedroom and land up under your bed, and so you simply pick them up, and of course you have to be careful of the razor-sharp beak. Uh, they can draw blood, and you can pick them up quite easily, uh, they just don't scramble around too fast on the ground and ring them and let them go again. We've also ringed them at the burrows, but one has at night, but one can only do that on the edges so that one doesn't walk uh, through the colony. And then the fairy tern, a really stunning bird. We catch good numbers in our mist nets while we catching lesser noddies. Uh, much less uh, numbers than the lesser noddies, but they in between, uh, breeding in between on the open branches without building a nest, and they really are stunning birds in the hand. 
white-tailed tropic birds, also very common, and amazing birds. Uh, when they are on eggs or very small chicks, one can pick them up off the nest and ring them right there and uh, put them back down again. Uh, the small chick on the far left bottom is much too small to be ringed, but the immature on the far right at the bottom is already uh, not flying yet, but large enough to ring. The adults, as I said, you can pick them up off the nest, but they also do fly into the mist nets while you're just doing general ringing on the island. Uh, the problem with that is that their beaks have very sharp serrated edges and there are lots of these uh, serrations and they get very tangled in the net. So it takes some time to work uh, the net out from the beak, but still they really, and one also has to be really careful to not be uh, bitten by these birds, uh, but they really are stunning birds in the hand, really great to have. Great, greater frigate bird. Uh, they are found in large numbers on a reed island. They're not breeding there, but they, uh, certain times of year, come to rest there uh, in large numbers, several hundred. Uh, there are also some lesser frigate birds as well. They, on this cliff edge, uh, soaring around, resting on the rocks and trees. And uh, on the one trip there, uh, uh, two of the guys, uh, Pablo and Manuel, decided that they were determined to catch a greater frigate bird. This was quite a challenge. They crept up uh, to the rocks with a hand net and they nearly got one. They tried for two or three days. Uh, eventually they decided to use a noose, uh, put it the string where the uh, birds were coming to sit most often. And eventually, I think on the third day, they managed to noose a bird and uh, very quickly also put the hand net over it to stop it from getting away and very proudly and excitedly ran down the hill and brought it to us to ring and measure. And here you can see, measuring the bird, uh, it was quite, quite exciting. It's the first and only greater frigate bird that's been ringed with a suffering ring. Uh, many ha uh, chicks have been ringed on islands in the Indian Ocean. Uh, in fact, even given satellite transmitters. So quite a few movement studies have been done but I'm not sure if any other adults have been caught by other ringing schemes, but certainly other ringing schemes have been ringing chicks uh, on other islands. Right, and then to end off the Seychelles part of this talk is the wedge-tailed shearwater. Also has burrows uh, like the Audubon shearwater and we ring a few at night as well on the edge of the burrow colony, uh, but it is absolutely amazing to, in the evening, just listen to them coming back from the sea and uh, calling. So they have this really eerie sound uh, that they make and they're flying in and landing on the branches and then they fly down to the ground and crawl into their burrow. So if you didn't know it was a bird, you might not be quite sure what it was. Uh, but yeah, quite, quite a strange sound to hear. Right, here's a map showing the places that I have ringed in uh, around Africa. It's been mostly with suffering rings, except East Africa, where I was ringing with East African uh, rings. And then in other parts of the uh, world, I uh, joined ringers and they, of course, were using their own rings. Uh, I think Mark Harriman's is on, on the, uh, uh, present this evening. I remember many years ago visiting him in Belgium. And as he fetched me from the train station, he didn't live too far away, he said he had an exciting bird for me. And when we got back to his house, uh, he said that he had caught a black woodpecker just before leaving to fetch me, and it wasn't too far away. So he was able to show me this bird as well as all the migrant warblers and other birds that he was catching in his garden. So that was quite an experience for me. Uh, as you can see, most of my ringing has been in Southern Africa, including countries like Angola, lots in Namibia, Mozambique, uh, and, and so on. So 
much too many places to talk about. Uh, so uh, I won't talk about any more sites as such. But, um, oh, sorry, no, I will. Just two river expeditions that I did, which were quite exciting, just very briefly. Orange River in 2003 um, uh, was on the Namibian side. Uh, Peter Newpin had organized special permission to enter that area. We were camping and just moving along from site to site and doing ringing as much as possible. Uh, so caught all sorts of birds like the little bee eater, southern mast weaver, which for me was great to see the size difference, very small in the arid areas of Namibia and Northern Cape compared to the Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, where I've caught really lots of them where they are quite a, a bit larger. At the one site, I picked up a rock to secure my guy rope, and there was a scorpion that had just started molting. So that was quite uh, interesting. And I took a series of photos through the morning. This is just a photo of the final molt when the skin was off completely. Uh, so I've got all the other photos, which were also submitted to scorpion map. So really quite an unexpected find while bird ringing. And then the Zambezi River in 2012, I was asked to do a ringing course on an island in the Zambezi River. We, uh, the only way to get there was crossing the river in these canoes. It felt a bit shaky, especially with a fast flowing river, but the paddlers are quite experienced and so it was all good. Uh, and then uh, of course, arriving in Livingston by plane was really a treat to see Victoria Falls. And I also spent a day uh, of my own time after the course just to explore the falls uh, as well. So we really had all sorts of interesting birds that we ringed, including Copy Sunbird, Little Bee Eater and loads of others. Uh, it was really a treat just seeing the Zambezi River and uh, enjoying the sunsets in the evenings and yeah, just being really in a remote, wild place of Africa. Right, now I'll just talk about a few species that I've enjoyed catching over the years. Uh, and I don't do any Balchatri work myself. I've gone with other people who've uh, done Balchatri work, uh, but I have caught quite a few raptors in my own mist nets just by chance while ringing. Uh, the first raptor I ever caught was a little sparrowhawk. And that was the year before coming to Suffering. I caught it in Pretoria at my previous uh, job. And uh, about two years later, after I was at Suffering, someone phoned me and said, oh, a bird flew into their uh, house uh, chasing a dove. And so they caught it and read the ring number on the bird. And I was absolutely amazed when I looked it up that it was the bird that I had ringed uh, two years previously. So that was really quite, uh, quite uh, 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 an exceptional recapture by the general public. The pygmy falcons, I've caught a few of those around sociable weaver nests. They're really uh, amazing birds, very small, but you can see the female on the left, the chestnut back and the male on the right and uh, really amazing to hold in the hand. African goshawk, I've caught a few in, the, in my mist nets over the years. One black-winged kite and also a red-breasted sparrowhawk. The sparrowhawk was an uh, uh, interesting story. I put my nets at a Cape Weaver roost site in reed bed and I'd caught there before, caught lots of Cape Weavers. And on this particular morning, I saw the sparrowhawk arriving just after I'd put my nets up and flying low over the reeds. The birds saw it as well. The weavers stopped calling immediately and the sparrowhawk turned and flew straight into my net. I really didn't expect that, but I was on top of it in an instant and uh, very happy to ring it. I didn't catch any weavers that day. They all flew off in a different direction to what they normally did, uh, but I was very happy with my catch. Uh, I've also caught a few pearl spotted owlets in my mist net, uh, so also really great. Their claws, of course, are very sharp, like a few other bird groups like swifts and sugar birds. Then I've ringed spotted eagle owl chicks. Someone had told me about these 
this nest on the ground. So it was really easy for me to, uh, uh, to pick up the, the young nestlings and to ring them. You can see in the bottom here, the ring is on this bird. I'd ringed all three. There's another chick there and one up in the top here. And the adult was just watching from a distance. distance and yeah, the birds were fine after I left. Some raptors that I've not ringed yet would love to. Uh, the rose eagle, I had this reciting, however, a uh, bird ringed uh, uh, in the Bot River, and I managed to see it in the mountains near Worcester, uh, some kilometers away, uh, five years later, uh, with this wing tag. I've also seen quite a few black sparrowhawks in and around uh, my garden where I live in Cape Town, and uh, been able to uh, track the histories of these individuals, all ringed around Cape Town. Uh, nothing uh, exciting in terms of movements or uh, longevity yet, uh, but still great to contribute to the Black Sparrowhawk project. I think one of the most unused, usual captures that I've had was some years ago. I was ringing in, ringing in Cape Town near uh, Sunflay. Uh, next to the Kaisers River, I had a whole bunch of nets up in the reed beds. And then I also put up a net here across the Kaiser River on a little bridge going uh, low over the, the river where the yellow block is marked. And uh, I, it, this was to catch weavers flying along the river. And I've caught quite a few there. And the one time I went to check the nets, there was an African data. It had flown uh, just along the river, just over the bridge and straight into the net, the bottom shelf. And so its toes were caught and, and its beak as well. And so I was able to uh, get the bird out. Uh, amazingly enough, I had forgotten my large rings on that day. But fortunately, I was able to phone my wife and she was able to bring them very quickly. And so uh, we had measured the bird in the meantime and carried on with other birds. And as soon as she got there, I was able to put the ring on and let it go. But certainly one of the more unusual birds I've caught or unexpected for a mist net, um, but really exciting to have in the hand. Of course, I have ringed so many different places, so many birds. Uh, one would think that uh, all ringing is wonderful and great. And I guess on this particular occasion, the ringing was exceptional, but the circumstances around the ringing were terrible. Uh, it was ringing on a dairy farm where the farmer uh, said we, uh, it was quite happy for us to put up our tents. You can see on the left in the background, one of the tents. And so we were a team of a few ringers and uh, we stayed there for the weekend. But this is uh, near Malmesbury, one of the largest uh, dairy farms in the Western Cape. And uh, because it's so large, uh, the, the dairy farm just hardly stopped. I mean, they were going on till 10 o'clock at night, uh, milking cows and starting at three in the morning again. And unfortunately, the birds that I was targeting were red belt quellias in these reed beds. And they were, these reeds were right next to the whole operation. So I guess we could have put the tents further away, but there was so much noise from the machinery and the tractors and the spotlights at night that I just couldn't sleep either night that we were there, but at least the ringing was still great. So yeah, one always has obstacles or things to contend with, uh, with ringing, but it really is worth it. And, uh, oh, so I'm coming to the end of my talk. I just love ringing. I love collecting the data, analyzing the malt, the biometrics, and all those kinds of things, but still it, it's just nothing compared to getting out there, seeing scenery uh, in different places, especially in Africa, but even other parts of the world, holding these amazing birds in the hand, watching birds while ringing. It's just uh, the best thing ever. So if you would like to come on a ringing expedition, please let me know. And that's the talk. Thanks very much, Dieter. Uh, just wonderful to have you sharing your 
absolute passion for bird ringing and everything else that goes with it. Um, and uh, I think that those of us who, uh, who are also bird ringers, uh, you know, share in that with you. And um, yeah, we perhaps don't get the opportunities that you do to get out there. But uh, wonderful. Thanks very much. And uh, lovely to see those places and some of those special birds. Um, our time is, uh, is a little bit short. Uh, there was just um, a couple of comments uh, from Jonathan Neumann. Um, he just mentioned, uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the weaver's roost in, in mixed species flocks, is that, uh, is that usual? Yes, they often do. Uh, so widow birds, weaver birds, it varies in different areas. Sometimes it's one species, but certainly often several species. Nesting, uh, right. Yeah. right, thank you. And then uh, just one other comment, well, a question. It's to do with the, the noddies in the Seychelles. Um, uh, Jonathan again saying, uh, did you, you know, um, I, he assumes that you had a good, good numbers of recaptures of the, uh, of the noddies. There were so many, I mean, on Arid and Kuzan, I mean, there are thousands. And so even with ringing several hundred, we did have some recaptures. I don't remember, I think even between years, but not high numbers between years, but certainly ringing from day to day, we'd had, we had quite a few recaptures, yes. Great. Thanks very much, Dieter. I think we're going to move on.